Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 108 of the podcast. It's the 24th of January, 2018, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. Anne Oman and Anna Brown join me again to answer your questions about unschooling and parenting. This month, we dig into questions around the challenge of meeting the needs of everyone in the family, the conventional idea that you shouldn't do things for your children that they can do for themselves, the interplay of releasing control over food alongside the real constraints of a food budget, and ways to help our children deal with negative comments. As a personal update, I just want to give you a heads up that registration for the winter expedition of the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit closes next Wednesday, the 31st. It's a great option if you'd like more help with the real personal work of bringing unschooling principles into your family's everyday lives. You can find out more about it at childhoodredefined.com. And a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And I'm taking another shot at welcoming Roisin McAnulty. Thanks so much for letting me know how to correctly pronounce your name, Roisin. I deeply appreciate all my patrons and their generous support. It's vital to helping me share unschooling information and inspiration with anyone who wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Anna. Our culture has an independence agenda and it starts at birth. I chose deliberately to instead foster connection and community. I think that's such an important idea to consider. I mean, just think about it. Even from birth, our culture is all about the milestones, rolling over, sitting up, eating food, walking, talking. And it's not because we're excited for our children, but because we're excited for us. Finally, we don't need to feed them. Finally, we don't need to carry them everywhere. We push them to be independent, not for their sake, but for ours. But you know what? In a safe and nurturing environment, those things are going to happen anyway on our children's timetable. Instead, as Anna said, we can foster connection and community with our children. So envision that. In that loving environment of trust and respect, our relationships soar. And it turns out that's where great learning happens on their timetable. And now let's get to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and I'm happy to be joined again by Anne Oman and Anna Brown. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Now, the three of us host the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit together, and I've shared my thoughts about it in my podcast intros the last couple of weeks. But since the summit is currently open for registration and you guys are here, I thought I'd ask if either of you (laughs) would like to share any words. I would love to. Uh, This is so exciting to be opening it up again because the last expedition that we had was our first online summit and the feedback and the testimonials that we have been getting have just been just so heartwarming and completely validating like like every dream and vision that we ever had for (laughs) uh, the work that we put into this and um, what I love about it is that like when I'm going over the, the questions for the Q&A here, I'm always thinking, oh, God, I, you know, we talk about this it, at the summit and we dig so much deeper. So, you know, I hope that whoever finds value in the three of us and the, our different voices that we share here in the Q&A, um, uh, join, you, I hope you join us at the summit because we do all dig deeper um, in our, with our own unique voices. And so you get all these 
perspectives on everything. So, Anna. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really the same. I'm just so excited that it's open again. And I feel like the fall expedition went, I, I, like you said, just kind of a dream. I mean, the people that we've met and the feedback they've shared and the experience of all of it has just been amazing. So I'm super excited and hope that more people will join us this time. Yay! And yeah, right. We get to we get to know we get to know you deeper. That's that's the other thing I want to say. You know what I mean? This this is kind of we read your questions and everything, but we get to interact with you at during the summit. Okay, I'm done. I won't interrupt you again. (laughs) Well, it's funny because that's exactly where I was going to (laughs) go. I just say yeah. I just enjoyed so much uh, addressing the the questions and and the conversations that we're having in in the Facebook group. Um, it's just so fun to see how people are taking in um, the stuff that we're sharing through the summit and to see uh, the kind of questions and connections it makes for them and then having those conversations. So now I'm good too. And just, and okay, and one more thing. Just seeing, <laughs> sorry, just seeing the beautiful families, you know, like that's been really beautiful yeah, and people are sharing fun. pictures and, and just, you know, a lot of little kids that I'm not around all the time now. And it's just, oh my goodness, so beautiful. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, before we get started with our regular questions, I just wanted to quickly address an anonymous question that we received. Uh, It wasn't really about unschooling, and they have no plans to move to unschooling, so it wasn't a question that we'd typically dive into here, but they were asking whether they could carry an unschooling attitude while their seven-year-old son went to school, and I just wanted to say that definitely what you've learned through your unschooling research about how learning works and ways to be in relationship with our children, those things are still true even when a child goes to school. You can continue to fully support and respect your child. You don't need to bring the school system's power dynamic home with you. You don't need to value grades just because the teachers are assigning them. You don't need to compare your child to other children just because they are in a classroom together. Um, Maybe take a listen to episode 32 with Alex Polakowski because we chat at length about how she continued to follow her unschooling principles while one of her children chose to go to school. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And now, would you like to get us started with our first question, Anne? I would love to. Our first question comes from Elena in the UK. And she writes, hi, I have a question about balance, which I'm sure is something that all families have difficulty with sometimes. We are an unschooling family of four. The two boys, age seven and four, have never been to school. However, I was previously a primary school teacher, so my need to de-school has been great and is still ongoing, probably unending. We are a neurodiverse family with highly sensitive spirited children who find some forms of communication difficult. Our main challenge at the moment is in balancing all the needs of our family. My older son is keen to spend time in museums and galleries and taking part in activities related to his interests. It is important for him to have time to explore exhibits and information closely with a lot of talk with myself and or his dad. However, his brother is not in a place where these things are of interest, and he has an overwhelming need to run and climb and shout. That is not appropriate in these sorts of spaces. Uh, Similarly, my younger son has a need to control what is being done at home. He cannot tolerate his brother watching documentaries on the television or reading books with me. He is unable to verbalize his reasons for this, although I think it could partly be about wanting my attention and does not seem to understand explanations of why his brother finds these things important. We manage it as best as we can with lots of options for him. We have a garden with lots of equipment, an indoor swing and trampoline, a range of tablets and Lego, which he loves. But often it doesn't seem to matter what he is doing. He still needs to manage what his older brother is doing as well. I try hard to split my time between them or find things that will work for both of them, but this seems to be getting harder to juggle with the need to also feed them and do a little housework. I already outsource as much as I can by hiring a cleaner. I also need to balance my own mental health as I struggle with anxiety. We do not have family near enough to rely on regularly, although my parents do as much as they can to support us, and friends are currently unable to take one or the other of the boys as they find their needs to challenge, needs challenging to fit in with their own children. 
I do worry that by acquiescing to my younger son's need to manage and control how our time is spent may be setting him up for difficulty in later life. But I am aware that this may well be due to my need to de-school further in this area. Not acquiescing leads to destructive hour-long meltdowns, which is distressing for everyone, and I feel it is not a part of who he is. In general, he is a loving and gentle child. It feels like when he is not able to control the situation, he experiences real fear. At the same time, I am concerned that his older brother is missing out on the things he feels are valuable, and he has told me often he often feels I care more about what his brother wants than what he wants. My husband tries hard to help this balance. Relaxing bedtime has really helped because it means we have more time in the evening with two adults around. However, he works long hours, often at weekends as well as all week, and has a long commute, so cannot be around as much as the rest of us need him. I often feel that what our family actually needs is a major review of how we are living in regards to my husband's work and where in the country we live. I'm hoping you can help me with some more ideas for short-term solu solutions, however, or at least reassurance that it does get easier. I am dreading the shorter, darker, wetter days when we will find it harder to get into nature as things seem to be worse on those days. Okay, going to take a breath here. <laughs> Hi, Elena. Thank you so much for your questions and for sharing your family with us. I always love hearing about different unschooling families. I hear that you're doing so much to keep everyone happy, and it does feel challenging at times. And I see that you're providing your children with things that they need and love in their lives, and that feels really good to me. Uh, what I want to start out talking about is the thought that family life is something that needs to be balanced. The thing about that is this. The factors that are needed in order to balance anything have to be precise and unchanging. Or if they do change or shift, then compensation has to be made on the other side to make it balance again. That sounds and feels so precarious to me. Uh, you know, it's for this reason why I've never used the concept of finding balance in our lives. I remember the first time I examined why that concept didn't feel right to me. And it was because it felt like um, saying that we were trying to balance life was only placing even more weight and um impossible tasks on our shoulders and burden. So I've always kind of rejected the concept of having to balance life, uh, even though most everyone else uses that. I instead deeply connect to the concept of allowing the flow of life. And right there, even as I say that, I can feel such a huge shift from balance, which feels, you know, forced and precarious, to flow, which feels honoring honoring of life and allowing it. Um, <laughs> and as always happens, when I hold on to concepts to ponder them, um, something so appropriate shows up in front of me to help me explain it, what I mean even better, because I use such anio concepts <laughs> in my language. <laughs> um, and last night I was browsing Facebook and my favorite page, Trinity Esoterics, had a photo about flow. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, it said, navigate your day by what the flow is supporting. And I just want to read the text that um, they had written out next to the photo. It said, quote, dear ones, you put yourself through an incredible amount of angst trying to force things to happen before they are energetically ready to do so. The energies no longer support effecting and forcing. They support flowing and allowing. Navigate your days by what the flow is supporting and you will get there, we promise. And the beauty of taking that approach is you will be far less battered and worn when you do arrive at your desired destination, which means you will be better to embrace it and enjoy it fully. Doesn't that feel much more in line with how your soul wishes to experience things? End quote. So, yeah, I, I relaxed into the truth of those words. They're very similar to the words I use when I speak or write a flow in our lives. Um, back when my kids were the age that your boys are now, that's kind of what our days were like. I often described our days as ebb and flow because uh, mostly it was honoring and allowing all that was a part of the flow of our lives, our activities, our conversations, our uh, home jobs, our play, our joy, our challenges, uh, the times we would be together, come together, and the times we would separate and go uh, our own ways to do our own things. 
Um, understanding that life is not meant to be forced or balanced is a huge aspect of letting go of control and even in making a pivot from the way you view challenges that are in front of you. By seeing any conflict as a part of the flow, you can tap into that swirling goodness that is all around you as a part of the flow of your lives and understand that the challenges are a part of it, but they are not all of it. And they most certainly aren't anything that is meant to be gathered up and balanced. This simple pivot in our language and our perspective sets the tone and energy for our days. And we can allow the flow to be and float downstream right along with it. Doesn't that feel like such a relief the flow of our lives allows us to honor everyone in our family and truly see their needs and desires as a part of who they are instead of feeling like they're throwing things off balance. The flow of life includes the joys and challenges and yet also holds really infinite possibilities for both in it. Here's an example of what our days um, looked like when my boys were young, a, a day at, when we were at home, that is. Uh, Jacob and Sam are so very different. Jacob's energy was very kind and generous and aware and deep and had a weighty gravitas to about it. He would sit and read a hundred books with me if he could, and he loved to have conversations. Sam's energy felt light and playful, and he would be playing with the sticks or swords or whatever while Jacob and I were reading, yet he wouldn't be too far away from us because he enjoyed listening to the books also. Um, Jacob often loved to direct Sam's play. Most of the time, Sam enjoyed this game with Jacob, following his direction in make-believe play, because, you know, they kind of understood the differences in not only their personalities, but in their skills and their strengths, and they often complemented each other in this way. Jacob had challenges with his motor skills, so that's why he enjoyed having Sam act out their make-believe play with their Playmobil or other character toys. And Sam was also Jacob's hands while playing video games, and Jacob would stand by and give him directions in that. That was really cool to watch. And during the times when Jacob would be happy doing something by himself or if he fell asleep for a nap, I would seek Sam out and ask him if he wanted to play a game with me or something so that we could have some time together without Jacob's direction. And when Sam was happily playing his computer games or video games, I'd seek out Jacob and we'd have our time together reading, having our conversations and doing the things that had value to Jacob. And if the other one ended up joining us, we'd come together again, the three of us, figure out what we wanted to do, or the two of them would start doing something, and I'd go off and do something I needed to do. And this was our flow, basically. The focus was not on separate needs. The focus was kind of on a trust in the coming together and the separating apart, the ebb and the flow. And so the energy was one of feeling united and connected no matter what. If an issue came up, we'd come together to discuss it and talk about possibilities to solve it so everyone could get what they wanted and needed. And there was a trust in that also. There were no lines drawn, no scales to balance, no measuring one's child's interest against the other. There really was just swirling, flowing life. And Probably the most important factor in making sure that the energy of our flow was one of connection and unity was me. I saw it as my job to be the one connecting kind of all of the pieces of who we are and what we needed and what we wanted. And I gathered them up as they were swirling around. And then we followed the flow and talked about it if something wasn't feeling right. Um, again, it wasn't my job to gather it all up and try to balance them, thinking that I just spent 30 minutes with Jacob, so I need to give Sam 30 minutes. I feel like it was my job to celebrate that flow and stay in an energy that was respectful, joyful, and anticipating of fun and peace. And that was done through conversations. Um, I've often talked about how our favorite time to talk was when, like I was doing the laundry or we were emptying the dishwasher, kind of when our hands were busy and our discussions were free and happy and full of excitement and possibilities. And it was during these times, too, when I would ask questions about what they were doing and they'd tell me about the game. They would tell me about the show they were watching or we'd talk about what we want to do the rest of the day. But overall, seeing and following the flow of our lives led us to more connection, not separation. And these positive, possibility-filled 
uh, conversations and discussions about anything, about challenging issues that came up and everything, brought about an understanding of each other's needs and desires and strengths and depth. So I'm seeing that this might be useful for you in many areas that you describe in your questions. An example being your concern about acquiescing to your son's needs, um, because even using the word acquiescing s sort of discounts the validity of his needs and desires. If you see his needs as a part of the flow of your lives and you see your older son's needs the same way, then that's kind of filled with a celebration of who they are. And when they kind of see each other being celebrated um, by you, even in ways that may seem, you know, kind of challenging, then that just kind of brings an awareness and a connection with them where they can more clearly see each other um, for who they really are. You know, another human being in the family who also has valid needs and desires. Um, you clearly can see that not honoring your son's need to direct situation is not the best thing for him nor anyone else in your family. Um, more importantly, it brings about a real fear in him. So seeing his need to direct things as a valid part of the flow of your lives would validate him and celebrate him for being who he is. Um, I just want to tell you the story when my kids were little and I did uh, parent child story time at our local library. There was an older unschooled girl there and other parents had told me about how she always needed so much attention and they would kind of groan and roll their eyes when she would come toward us and everything. And when I first observed her at a story time, I, I could see why people thought that about her. But I knew that she was a sweet girl who honestly didn't get much validation in her home for being who she is. So I understood why she wanted attention. And I also saw that she was kind of controlling of things. So I asked her if she would be my assistant at every story time. And I would give her specific tasks to do. And oh, my goodness, she would just shine so bright. I just came across this a while ago. I have a picture that is so dear to me, um, mostly because this girl is a friend of mine and is now 23 years old. <laughs> and um, her mom passed away a few years ago. And in the picture, she's sitting at the computer with a small child on her lap and a young child by her side. And she's showing them how to play a game. And, you know, she's someone who likes to direct and help and uh, like like my corgi, <laughs> I just noticed my corgi <laughs> sitting here. She needs a specific job to in order to fully be who she is and then shine. Um, so I don't know if you find value in that, but I hope you may apply it to your situation. Uh, lastly, I just want to refer to your language again because, as I said, it sets the tone and energy of your home. And when you say you dread the shorter, darker, wetter days, you find it harder to get into nature and it's worse on those days, that even just having that thought is setting up the energy in your home. To project the negativity um, into the future brings dread and fear and unease into your current moment here now. It doesn't allow and honor the flow of your lives because that's in the future sometime. So, And you have no idea what that day may be like, what those days may be like. Um, so you don't even have to give that a thought right now. You really can just focus on the flow of this glorious day ahead of you and allow it to be honoring all that is in this day and all that you and your children are. So again, I, there are some shifts I see you could be doing to allow life to bring you together, honoring the flow. And if you see it as, as your job to be the one who does the joyful allowing and the joyful connecting, then the children might be able to see each other in a more honoring way also. I really think children can relate to the concept of flow because that's their job as unschoolers, to follow their own flow. And so to talk to them in those terms also, to me, already feels just so connecting. Pam? <laughs> I just love how you focused on on the flow and the flow of life and how it, it ebbs and flows ebbs and flows just so much more rather than than trying to look for that balance so that I was I love that you picked that piece out <laughs> and hi Elena thank you so much for your question and definitely sometimes there are seasons when things are more challenging feel more challenging and for me when I couldn't yet see a way through something <clears throat> I would dig deeper into curiosity mode 
so I'd just be, I'd be watching the goings on a little bit more keenly, paying attention for opportunities to engage with my kids in those kinds of conversations and was mentioning, you know, side by side kind of uh, opportunities where we're doing something, we're having a fun chat and, and it can flow into the conversation. Um, so I just had some ideas about those. You could chat um, pretty regularly with your elder son about his younger brother, brainstorming ideas around ways for him to pursue his interests at home if he's finding it frustrating. And you talked a lot about the way you're seeing these things, but it is important to see how they're seeing it too, um, because that's what you're trying to help them with. Uh, you could ask for his ideas and how he thinks you might accomplish them because you want to show him through your words and actions that you guys are a team working on helping him figure out ways to accomplish the things that he wants to do. So, for example, you could brainstorm some ways he can watch documentaries without his brother interrupting him. You know, like, can the TV be in a room that has a door on it? Uh, we were always rearranging things in the house. That was one of the fun things. As our interests and needs changed, things shifted around all the time. Uh, maybe you can read books together at night when his brother's asleep or when dad's home to play with him. Maybe you guys can focus on your elder son going out with dad to museums and activities as often as possible while you can focus on your younger son and fill his needs uh, for attention or play or act or jumping about, you know, with your indoor swing and trampoline and everything. I know you mentioned your husband works uh, quite long hours, so I think it would help to plan these outings rather than waiting for the time to open up to appear. Because if they're in the calendar, hopefully your husband may be able to better organize his work around them and your son knows it's coming up. So there's tangible proof of doing some things that he enjoys. Uh, in these kinds of situations, I found it's also really helpful just to have a plan for the everyday stuff too. <clears throat> Like, uh, next time your brother interrupts you watching TV, I'll invite him to play pillow fights with me in the bedroom and then follow through on that. It, so when you when you come up with that plan ahead of time, now that doesn't appear to be a random act. They see that uh, we're working with them to meet their needs, even when we're doing things with their siblings. And then you can chat about it with them later, see how it went and tweak the plan. It'll help, I think, to point out that finding things that won't work, that work won't happen overnight, right? That, that this is something that you guys are actively working on together. And, and that's all part of the flow and the conversations and the seeing who's here in this moment and, um, and meshing plans that fit with that particular moment. Um, you might apologize to him about his feeling like you care more about his brother. You can explain to him what you see happening with his younger brother, his needs and his fears, and ask for his advice on ways you guys might mesh his and his, uh, his brother's needs together. Because um, not only do children have great ideas, it also helps them feel like they're a whole part of the conversation, part of that flow, a, uh, a whole important part of the way your day unfolds and flows in your family shows them that their input is valued. Uh, you can chat with your younger son too at his level of understanding about how we can get to control ourselves, um, but not others. And you mentioned um, that he's not verbal, able to verbalize it, but um being able to even just mention it to him will help him um, consider it, to think about it, and just brings it into part of the flow of your day as well. It also helps you to be um, picking up more observations. You know, once something's top of mind, it we see more connections to it. Your insight about him feeling fear when he's not in control is great to dig into. You can look for patterns in what he reacts to. Um, and how he reacts and see what insights you can glean from that. <clears throat> and then I wanted just to touch on the idea of acquiescing to his control, because that's so interesting. Um, 
it, it's another uh, perspective or, or word that I've never used, uh, but I can see what you mean. Instead, we always frame things as a choice, right? Mm-hmm. So thinking back in similar circumstances, this this ha- only happened when um, <clears throat> the other child was okay with it, right? Like I said, a choice. Say they decided that what they saw their sibling wanted was more important to their sibling than what they wanted was to them. Um, so I wouldn't see it as acquiescing. We would see it as I'm choosing to join them in what they want to do. Um, and sometimes they could see that their sibling was teetering on the edge and whatever was the issue in the moment wasn't worth pushing them over. And sometimes they really wanted to do their thing on their own. And at those times I would take on, um, their siblings reactions, even if it was, as you described, an hour long meltdown and, and work with them through it. That was an opportunity for us to be together and learn tools and for them to see my support and to, to build our trust. There was so much that was happening in that experience as well. So none of the kids were expected to acquiesce to a sibling to make my life easier. They weren't responsible for each other. I was responsible for both of them individually. Um, I think that kept a lot of the potential baggage out of their sibling relationships. And as I got older, they became just so supportive of each other and they, they still are, but it was still always everybody's choice. It wasn't one person emotionally controlling, um, other people's choices. Anna. Excuse me. Yeah. So, I mean, so much echoing what the two of you have said, but um, I guess I just want to say too, that what I learned having two small kids close in age is that things change all the time. So I tried to remember that and sometimes offered as part of the discussion, which Pam kind of mentioned. So in your situation, you know, you could talk to your older son saying, right now your brother really wants to do X and developmentally he's having a hard time waiting or understanding what we're doing here and, and asking for suggestions from both, you know, state what you see, you want to do X, he wants to do Y, how can we solve this? And you can start throwing out silly suggestions to lighten the mood and get the brain storming started. You know, I found that that my girls were so much more creative than I was at problem solving. And when they were involved in solutions, they had this buy-in and excitement about it. And the process of creative problem solving is such a helpful skill. And it takes practice to develop. So oftentimes I think that parents and moms in particular feel like they have to solve everything alone. And that becomes a very huge weight that you're carrying around. And as you get better solving things together, things get a lot easier. And, you know, they're both going to be developing and growing along the way. So trusting that this part that's rubbing a little bit will pass and change and develop, you know, and work on your language and energy like Anne talked about and enjoying where you are right now, you know, that's going to go such a long way. And I did just want to say definitely there's just no need to project way out into the future about fears about your son later in life. You know, he is young and he has a lot of growing and changing to do and he's figuring out who he is and how he wants to be in the world. And that's just part of the process. You know, I think we it comes up a lot where we, you know, reiterate having conversations again, because I think a lot of times we're in our heads, you know, thinking all this, we have to do and solve it and fix it. And we're having this problem. And, and really once you start that open communication in a family, things just develop so differently and you have that flow and it feels, um, very different than what you're describing. So I think that um, is just something I wanted to reiterate. And I also just said I wanted to love your thinking about looking at that bigger picture of changes that you can make as a family to be together more. You know, we did that along the way and are so, so grateful for the time that we've had together, especially now as we're, you know, our children are older and and one leaving the nest and all that kind of stuff. So (laughs) it's just really, it is really cool to make that a priority and figuring out ways to make that work when you're seeing there's a little bit of a rub there with the time. So good luck with all of that too. And Pam, back to you for the next question. (laughs) Okay. Question number two is from Amy in Oregon. She writes, I am becoming acquainted with radical unschooling philosophy. I have often read that you should not do something for your child if they can do it themselves. Also that kids benefit from doing regular chores, responsibilities. 
Based on the principles of radical unschooling, what do you think a parent should do if a child does not want to do something they are able to do for themselves? As an example, putting their clothes on. I have a two and four year old. Same thing for doing chores. What if a child does not want to do a chore or to help with household tasks? Thanks in advance. I love your podcast. Well, thank you very much, Amy. I'm glad you're enjoying the podcast. Um, as for your question, those kinds of, if they can do it, they should do it themselves. Those kinds of comments are wrapped up in generic, conventional expectations and rules. Now, what we can do instead is look to our children as individuals with real needs, wants, abilities, and motivations, and realize that each moment is unique and worth considering. So, for example, they aren't wanting your help getting dressed to frustrate you. There's a real and valid reason behind it. You just don't know what it is yet. And by helping them, you are building their trust in you that you will be there to help them whenever they want it even when they are young, especially when they're young. There's a great quote from Pam Sarushian. As we get older and our kids grow up, we eventually come to realize that all the big things in our lives are really the direct result of how we've handled all the little things. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's so true. Now is when we're building the foundation of our relationship with our children. Now is when we're building their trust in us. Will we be there for them when they ask for help? It's not really about getting dressed. It's about your relationship. If they learn through experience that you won't help them do things when they ask because you have judged them capable of doing them on their own, that's the relationship pattern that they will learn. Now, it might help to think of this in terms of your relationship with your partner or spouse. When they when you ask for help with something, how would it feel if they answered you, you can do that yourself, so I'm not going to help you. Your request for help wasn't about your ability to do the thing. It was motivated by something else, some other need in your life. And it's the same with your children. Now, I think I'm pretty safe in promising that you won't be dressing them when they're 16. They don't need to be forced to practice. We don't need to push them to be independent. They really, really will get there all on their own, on their own timetable. In the meantime, we can focus on the relationship, on building the connections and trust between us. And you know what? Exactly the same with chores. You can feel free to invite them to join you. You can enjoy their company and maybe some of their help and not judge the results. But it's okay if they say no, because in that moment, maybe it's not in their flow. Anna? Yeah, it's so, <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm saying that too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just never really identified with those beliefs because like you said, it's really a whole different paradigm. Um, I do things for people all the time that they can do for themselves. My husband, my mother, my friends. And of course, I'm not doing everything for them, but I would never not help them because they could technically do it. You know, that's part of our relationship and the connections and being human beings together. Um, with dressing little ones, oh gosh, I would just say savor every minute of that because before you know it, they won't need or want your help. And I found just like Pam said, when kids ask you to help with something that they can do, they are often looking for connection. It's not about whatever the thing is they're asking about. And that's something that I wanted to provide at every opportunity. Our culture has an independence agenda and it starts at birth. I chose deliberately to instead foster connection and community. And as for chores, you know, it's the same. We never had chores. We live in a house together. We did the things that needed to be done. And, you know, we've talked about this on the podcast before, and I think Pam's had specific podcasts about it. You know, I think it helps to look at expectations needs once and to keep the conversation open again, just like I said with the last question, this is all just about conversations because, <clears throat> excuse me, we have not, we don't have have tos or expectations. We can just talk to each other and ask for help when it's needed and it flows. And I think that trust really develops when you do that because when I'm asking for help, 
just like Pam said, it's not because I can't do it myself. It's because I'm tired or something else is going on or I need help here to get this other thing done. And so when we have those conversations and we're open about our needs and what's happening, that trust develops and people help. You know, we just really have never had an issue when it comes to this. And that doesn't mean that there's things I haven't had to change my expectations about, but that's not just related to kids. That can be related to my husband or someone else, you know? And so then I have to look inside of me and what are my needs related to this. And so, you know, again, there's some other podcasts where we talked a little bit more in depth about that, but those are the few things I wanted to share. Anne. Yes, and I knew Anna and Pam would cover all of that also. <laughs> it's like in question one, that's why I went in a different direction. I knew they would be practical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, last night I was laying on the couch and I had uh, some challenges during the day. And I was covered in my favorite blankie and I had my favorite show on. And I needed the remote, which was on the coffee table, but I couldn't re quite reach it from where I was laying. Sure, I could have sat up and leaned six inches to get it. <laughs> but I said to my husband, honey, can you hand me the remote? And you know what he did? He gave it to me. He handed it to me without shaming me, without telling me, what, are you crazy? And oh my goodness, that just added to all of the feelings of love and coziness that I was giving to myself as a gift after having some challenges in that day. And that's it right there. And not only that for our children, but it is one of the greatest gifts of my life mm -hmm. uh, to help my children when they ask for help. And um, to recognize that. I've recognized that more and more as they get older and need different kinds of help. You know what I mean? I never, ever once told them in all of their lives that they can do it themselves. I let them know, yes, it is an honor for me to help you. And getting dressed, oh my goodness, that's the time to give them love, to kiss their head. Mm -hmm. I remember the little baby bellies and wanting, you know, <laughs> Getting a chance to touch that ba that pre uh, toddler baby belly or whatever, <laughs> you know, when children are treated with love and kindness, they become love and kindness. My children know they're the first ones to help others when they need it. They're there for each other. They're 27 and 23 now, and they're asking uh, their father and I, if we need help moving snow, they're writing to us after a storm. Can we come help move snow or bring in wood for you? And again, that doesn't matter. That's not why we did it when they were young, so that they would help us when we were old. <laughs> um, it just is who they are and who they have become because uh, Sam even told me recently, he gets such joy from being available to help us. Mm. And wow, that what a, what a gift that is. Um, we are still helping them all that we can. Our kids have told us that we are the most generous parents in the world. And that comes from a place of deep love and respect and the feeling that they are still being cared for as adults, that they are not alone and have to go out into the world by themselves. That is a scary thing for kids to think about. And yet when they're brought up with this foundation of my parents are here to help me with no matter what I ask, you know, that is the most wonderful feeling in the world. And to me, it's a deeply spiritual one, because when I connect to, you know, my inner being, my source, I connect to that very feeling that I am incredibly loved and that I am always taken care of um, for me to make sh I, I for me to deliberately choose to be in the mindset that helping my children was a gift to me was uh, just incredible. It allowed me to receive the gift, to be open to receiving the gift of helping my children. And today uh, I, it carries through as Anna was saying, I help so many people my family's in my library. My mother who has dementia, I help her with anything and everything. And I am honored when I am at my mother's feet, putting her sneakers on and tying her shoes. Seriously. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that the giver is as blessed as the receiver. And not even with all these other reasons, but that is the only reason um, 
that I need for why I see helping my children or anybody else as a gift to myself. It's simply the way I choose to look at and live in this world. Yes. I love that. And, you know, when you were talking, that reminded me, I remember a few times when, say, my kids were, when they were older, like in their teens and stuff, and other children were here visiting. And, you know, I was help, ha- ha- very happily choosing to, you know, maybe pull together a snack so that they could, you know, mm-hmm. get really comfy mm-hmm. and watch their movie or whatever. And, and just do whatever, like even lately, you know, making uh, a lunch for Michael before he goes to work, right? But I don't feel it as a responsibility. I feel it as a gift, as something I want to do for him because I have the opportunity, because I'm here, mm-hmm. and um, I know he appreciates it. It's never flipped into an expectation. He never expects me to do it. Like the few times when something's come up and I haven't been able to, he's whipped together his lunch and off he goes. It's never, (laughs) mom, you haven't made my lunch yet or something. Right. (laughs) Right. You know, but I remember the comments from people and maybe this is, you know, she's coming at um, the question from the, the conventional expectations and, and the children will be like, no, no, we can do that. You know? And, and they would be, shocked when I say, Oh no, I'm happy to do it. I'm choosing to do it. They Mm -hmm. would like, look at me like I had two heads Mm -hmm. because it was just something that was a very different for them. They had been told if they could do it, they should do it for themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just a whole different, um, environment, a whole different, um, nature to the relationships, I guess is what I'm saying. But right. you just, you, yeah, and you just have, you just have to say, well, you know, I'm choosing this different kind of relationship. I'm, I'm not going to feel judged by their comments, you know, and sometimes mm-hmm. even with the parents, um, their comments would be like they were trying to judge me, but it's like, no, that's fine. You know, that's your way. This is my way. We're all good. Thanks. Right. <laughs> right. And for me, it's and just all other... about the relationship. And like this morning, our um, recording got pushed back just a little bit. And I was so glad because my daughter, who's 18 years old, was heading off to work and she can get her own food and go and she drives herself to work and she does completely without me. But I actually just really love that time where Mm -hmm. we talk in the morning and I'll prep her food and do and we're chit chatting and, and, you know, it's not a have to or a need to, or she's expecting it, but it is a gift and it's a special time to me. So, you know, I think it's, again, that's what I want to foster in, Mm -hmm. in our family. Right. And I, uh, taking it a little deeper also, um, it's in the asking, this is, this is a conversation that we always talk about conversations. Mm -hmm. This is the start of a conversation, the child asking for help. And, um, it's not that we have to say yes all the time if we're doing something. Um, but the buildup of honesty and trust through these conversations, Mm -hmm allows us to be honest and say, oh, yeah, I, I would love to help you. I'm going to, fi- can I finish this first or do you need me right away or stuff like that? Right. You know what I mean? It, it expands. It's not just, yes, I'm I'm going to drop everything. It's, it's the mm-hmm. honesty and the trust. And like yesterday, you know, we had an ice storm Saturday and uh, I was up late uh, texting with Sam Saturday night and he was talking to me about some things in his life. And, uh, I asked him if he wanted to come and be with his dad and I on Sunday. And, uh, cause he was talking about how he felt like he would love to connect with us. And so I wrote to him Sunday morning and I said, you know, dad, um, needs to, you know, do ice removal and bring in wood if you want to come and help and you know, make some grocery money and stuff. And, And he said, um, does he need help? Um, Because I do have, I have got, you know, stuff in the oven and I'm kind of low on gas and I need to save it for just going to get groceries today and all this other stuff. You know what I mean? And so that's the conversation also. It's not just, we're not just talking about, again, saying yes to everything. The conversation Mm -hmm. is truthful and honest and so respectful and with the foundation of love and kindness. And that's, that's what we're talking about. And, and it's back to the flow, right? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. That's it. That's it. The flow of Sam's life for the day uh, wasn't in the direction of doing this. And you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's honoring all of that, the flow of life. It's beautiful. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. We should probably go to the next question. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead to question three from Dell. Um, we are an unschooling family with three young children, the oldest being six. I have been really inspired by your podcast and website to embrace the idea of allowing my children a lot more control over their own eating. Everything I have read and heard around this now makes perfect sense, but I feel like I need to get my head around what it's going to look like for us a little bit more before I take the leap in that direction. The part that I find the most overwhelming and confusing at the moment is how this is going to work within the restraints of our relatively strict food budget. We eat a fairly good whole food diet, but a lot of ingredients have to be rationed in order for them to last the time that we need them to. In our own experiences with giving our children, quote, food freedom and control of their own eating, how did the practical aspects of budget play out for you? I understand that this is more of a consideration while my, ch my children are young than it will be when they are older and have a wider understanding of money, cost, availability, et cetera. But for now, I'm not quite sure the best way to approach this. For example, there are certain foods that the children would love to snack on, such as dried fruit and cheese. But if they constantly eat it on its own, then our available amount for the month will very quickly be used up. Whereas if I mostly use it as an ingredient to make other things, then this gives us much more food for the month. Once these ingredients are all used up, then not only will we not have them to eat on their own, but I will also have very little to work with to make them anything else for us. I have tried explaining the need to make things last, but I can tell that they are not at a stage where this means much to them, especially when they are wanting the thing they want. I don't want to constantly be saying no to them, but I'm pretty sure that these things are going to be asked for a lot. I love listening to your opinions and want to thank you in advance for your wonderful insight. So, okay, thanks for that question. And as I'm rereading it, I noticed a couple things that I didn't notice the first time. But um, so I, I may come back to that in just a second. But, you know, I think you're right that it will get easier as they get older. You know, in the meantime, maybe there are some ways to be a bit more concrete about them. So when you get home from the store, dividing those types of foods up into available for snacking and used for cooking. And the snacking items can be in a special drawer or a spot in the fridge. And they'll see in one spot what they have for that shopping period. Um, sometimes they may want to buzz through it all in one day. Other times they may decide to make it last. I think it's just probably too much to ask for them to conceptualize what would be needed for cooking over a long period of time as well. So taking that out of the equation might help. Um, you know, look at the budget and what types of things everyone's enjoying, involving them in the planning out of meals and snacks so that they feel included and have buy-in. They may even like to see it written down and have a list about it. You know, we never did that, but just throwing out some ideas. Um, we have never had budget constraints exactly like you're describing, but we definitely had things, especially snacks and treats that ran out before the next shopping trip was coming up. And we just kept an open dialogue and learned together how to make things last. And you know, then we got creative when things were gone and we still wanted a certain type of snack. You know, I definitely found it was cheaper to make snacks than to buy organic or natural snacks. So that helped us stretch our food budget. You know, even though it would add a little bit more work for me, it was well worth it. And the girls would at different times enjoy participating in the cooking process, sometimes making things with me, sometimes just keeping me company. So that became another, you know, relationship and connecting opportunity. And I think with anything, it's all about communication and not getting stuck in the thinking that there's one right way or one desired outcome. Be open and see what kind of ideas you all come up with for getting what you need within the framework of your budget, including looking at other areas of the budget. We found sometimes we like to let go of other expenditures to fund something that we were more interested in at the moment, and then we'd switch that up. So again, I think it's um, about being open and talking. And so what I picked up on when I read the question this time <laughs> was that you're not there, you're not doing it. And, and so I think that's really important because when our head, when we're c constructing scenarios in our head about how it's going to play out, it, that's not what's really happening. And what I found is that kids are very capable of having conversations and figuring things out and working together. And so in your mind, you may be thinking, oh, they can't handle this. They're not going to do it. But I think in practice, you'll see that they can. And I think especially as they learn to trust and open up around food, because what we've talked about this before, too, but what I saw over and over again were the children that were controlled around food were the ones that had 
the inability to have any kind of self-control around food. So they would come to my house where I would have different things available and they would just be shoveling in at the bowl and not playing or doing anything because they'd never been able to have this sweet or this thing or whatever it is. Whereas, you know, my girls who had options to have other things would just they if they wanted a sweet they'd eat a sweet if they wanted something salty they'd get something salty like we talked much more about like what your body's looking for <clears throat> because that whenever we have someone externally controlling us we tend to be drawn to wanting to do that thing <laughs> and to you know make that our own so anyway so i would just say dive in trust have the conversations and know that it's it's i think it's going to be a lot easier than you think it's going to be Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I started uh, picking up our candy and putting it away when we had those candy yeah, exactly. because they would eat all of our candy, mm-hmm. and you could tell. I mean, you know, I had to. I had to become what their parents do because uh, I didn't want their, you know, all of our stuff gone. So <laughs> it's funny. Um, but I, I'd like to focus, uh, as usual, and again, on the language and energy that um, you may be attaching to this, just so you can be aware of this. Um, I grew up in a home where the focus was on lack, and that did not feel good or safe to me at all. And Um, my uh, parents never seemed to have the money for the things that were valuable to us kids and yet seemed to have money for things that had value to them, like a bottle of wine. You know what I mean? So I just want to, um, as Anna was saying, um, uh, make sure that that's not what you're seeing. And, and without even thinking about it, maybe, you know, you're, you're saying these need to be for cooking or whatever, and, um, maybe validate the fact that they, uh, see stuff that they want that you want to cook with, you know, there's just a lot of, um, reassessment that could be going on here about that. Because like Anna was saying, you know, if, if life is just a constant no for them around food, um, much like the child who has his sugary foods restricted and gorgeous on candy, the, the child who, that lives with a lack mentality um, may think that when they do get some money on their own and everything, they need to create an overabundance of thing, these things in their lives that they were told no to all the time. So for me, it's just important to have a yes energy. Not in yes, you can have whatever you want when you want it, but yes, I see that sounds good to you to have right now. Let's let's uh, see if we can get more next time when we go. Remember that it's something that you love, and let's look at the list, grocery list again, and see how we can work this out. You know what I mean? So um, that's just what I like to focus on, because again, we're the creators of the energy in our home, and that's why our language and energy is important. Pam. Uh, yeah, definitely the same kind of ideas that inviting them in um, to help with maybe menu planning, um, mentioning the meals and the snacks and the things that contain their favorite ingredients, you know, just just chatting about the stuff that they love um, and <clears throat> involving them in the process just gives that abundance and and yes, kind of focus. Uh, you can invite them, as Anna mentioned, into conversations even around the family budget. Well, and Anne had the wine story too. You know, it's it's like just getting a feel for what it is that everybody wants to have, and the things that they're interested in are just as important as the things that we're interested in. And you can play around with those ideas. It's not that that you're being directed by them. It's that we're all having conversations together and enjoying that. It's just shaking things up and involving them as, as much as they're interested in being involved in those conversations. Um, I, I loved Anna's idea about, you know, when there's things that um, everybody wants and there's a certain amount, you know, being able to say, oh, look, here's, here's your, your share, your share, you know, and, and this is what we've got until the next time we go shopping. And, and if it runs out fast, you can have more conversations about, oh, you know, if we can increase that, what can we buy less of? Um, you know, what do you not want as much? It just sparks so many conversations. So even if there's a reality of, no, you don't have any uh, more of that particular thing now, it's, it's, that's just fodder for, 
you know, more conversation. It doesn't have to be a heavy, weighty, weighty no, um, you know, I'm so sorry. But it can be, oh, you know, that's gone. Let's, what, what was it that you liked about that? Was it the texture? Was it, you know, sweet, salty, all that kind of stuff. And, and see what you can substitute until the next time. You know, it, it again, I guess I, coming back to the flow, it's all that, that just happens in the flow. It's part of the constraint of this moment. Where can we go from here? And making it part of the larger conversations just within the family. Okay, question number four, Anne. Question number four is from Cher in New York. Hi, Cher. I'm in New York. <laughs> she writes, hi, my eight-year-old boys compete in gymnastics. They are naturally great at the sport, and my one son says he wants to go to the Olympics. All the kids on the team are in school, and they are constantly calling my boys stupid and asking them to answer questions like, what's 11 times 11? I learned that in pre-K. I'm smarter than you. They are all older, too, ages 9 to 14, and I think they are jealous. I'm starting to take it personally. I guess I still have de-schooling to do. I don't want to say anything to the parents or coach because I'm only hearing my boy's version of the story. What should I have my boys say? They keep replying, I didn't learn that yet. I think they are naive and innocent and don't realize that the kids are really being cruel. I have my tribe of friends who unschool with us, and we get the kids together all the time or online gaming. But the boys love the sport too much to have them quit. Okay, I hear you. And I know, yeah, that does feel really difficult when that comes up. Um, when my kids face circumstances like these, again, I'm going to talk about language. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought them to be innocent and naive. Um, uh, because, oh my goodness, they uh, they are... It's just such a huge disservice to them as they are such well-informed unschoolers who probably know more about the real world than most school kids do. So, um, you know, I want uh, if you remove that um, and the fact that they have been brought up in a respectful and trust centered home is the reason why they simply have no reason to not trust someone to not think that someone has the best intentions in asking them questions. So now their worlds expand again and they see that some people, not just kids, for whatever reason, uh, choose to act like bullies. Um, uh, one thing to be aware of also is the fact that your kids don't have the same experience bank as you do, and they're not seeing it through the same lens as you are. As you said, you take it personally, and maybe that's part of your de-schooling, and that's, that's great that you see that, because that's a slippery slope to be on when your children have challenges or for anything in your lives. Um, a great asset to any situation in our, in our lives is to remember to not take what is happening in our children's lives personally. Uh, so anyway, it might be good to ask them what they think about it, how they feel about it, if you haven't already. Um, because when I see bullying happening, whether it's in real life or in television or movies, what frustrates me the most is that often the energy of the person being bullied changes and they become exactly what the bully has projected them to be, the victim. Uh, and then again, that's not always the case. I also witnessed children standing up for themselves, not allowing anyone, not even their parents, to coerce them outside of what feels true and right to their own spirit. There are many people who don't allow anyone else to make them feel less than the magnificent being than they are. I love it when I see that. And so maybe if your children are asking for help in this, talk to them about this difference in response energy. You know what I mean? Um, the, how uh, the difference between being a victim, um, because they're not victims. They are, in fact, the creators of their own lives more than anybody else because they're um, uh, unschooled. So if you have a conversation about their lives and their learning and through their joy and everything that will help them maintain that uh, the non-victim energy. And I think our the, their best defense is to truly own um, this incredible kind of secret of unschooling that most kids don't have access to, not even a little bit. So again, perhaps remind, remind them about and instill some of that magical joy in their lives as they go off without you to do something that they're passionate about, which is what unschoolers do. They're gymnastics. 
uh, might give them strength as they leave you, strength and confidence in the, you know, magnificent beings that they are and strength and confidence in this life that you live together. And if they are asking you specifically how to handle it or what to say, I might tell them, first of all, they have no obligation to answer them if they don't want to, or if they do want an answer, they could simply say what is true of their lives. Like, if it was something I was interested in learning or needed to know for a reason, I could look it up or figure it out or ask someone who knows. You could think, say, you, you just told me the answer, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you are smarter. Um, you know, whatever. Whatever feels good to them. It's not the specifics of the answer. It's the energy, you know, I just wish for them to maintain um, while it's happening and um uh, you know, just holding on to the secret of their joy-filled lives that unschooling is, and not to believe anything the kids say about how smart or not smart they are. Pam? Ah, um, hi, Cher. And I just, I'll reemphasize, I think the first thing to do is to ask your boys how they feel about it. Maybe you have and you didn't mention it. That's That's fine. But yeah, that's the difference, especially when we're starting to take something personally. As soon as I feel that, it's like, oh, oh, I'm feeling something, you know, taking it personally about some situation that I'm not personally involved in. So that's always my clue that it's time to go figure out um, how the people involved are, are seeing it. Um, so as far as your boys are concerned, is it an issue for them? Are they happy to just keep replying? I didn't learn that yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, that's fine. Are they wondering why the kids keep asking them things? You know, these are the spotter for conversations. Maybe they are there just for the sport and they're not looking to develop any relationships with the other kids. Because as you mentioned, they have their great unschooling friends. And I bet they can already see the difference in the attitudes and the, the kids. And, you know, maybe they're just not looking to engage with these gymnastics kids. If they're happy with the way things are, it is probably something for you to work through. Now, I remember in those moments when I discover that it's mostly my work to do, I often actually look to my kids. Can I embrace their perspective on the situation? They're letting it roll off their backs. Do I have some baggage from my childhood that's getting in my way? Um, if they mention that it does uh, bother them, you can, as I mentioned, brainstorm some fun responses that will feel good to them. Um, maybe like asking a hard question back that they have memorized the answer to. I've heard some people um, that that has worked for them, but there's just a million ways you can go with that. And I just thought I would share a story because it reminded me um, of one year at Girl Guides, Lissy was getting tired of the questions and negative comments from the other girls and asked me to help her out. And it was obvious from the questions that they were often just repeating what their parents had said to them when the girls had come home to announce that there was a girl there that <laughs> didn't go to school. <laughs> so I chatted with one of the leaders and I mentioned, you know, that it wasn't Lissy's job to defend our lifestyle. And I offered to put together a one page handout of answers that they could hand out to the other parents. So I was putting together my notes last night and I did a quick search of our backups because Rocco is a whiz at that stuff. <laughs> and I actually found the document. <laughs> I wrote it in December of 2006, so 11 years ago, and Lissy was 12. I titled it Some Questions and Answers About Homeschooling. See, I didn't even use the word unschooling. There's no need to go there. They didn't even know what homeschooling was. And it opened with... I get the impression that there are a number of questions surrounding our family's choice to homeschool. This is completely understandable because this choice is not a very well-known option, so I thought I'd share some answers to typical questions. And here are the questions that I included. So these would have been based on the comments that Lizzy was getting. The questions were, is it legal? Do you follow a curriculum? How do you make friends? How do you get into college? And then there was a short more information section with a few links, including a link to my website. <laughs> and I closed it with, I hope this information has been helpful. Feel free to ask me if you have any more questions. So I specifically said, ask me because I didn't want questions going to Lissy anymore. And that took care of it. I didn't get any questions. And I imagine there was still the odd comment once in a while, but it was no longer overwhelming for Lissy. 
So I just thought I'd share a, a time when that had happened with us uh, at an activity and the approach that I took in that particular situation. Anna? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I love, you know, too, what, what you both said about definitely look inside because I know I can get defensive of my girls. And then when I step back or talk to them or really observe, it's like, that's all about me. <laughs> you know, it really isn't about how they're interpreting the situation. So I would definitely check in about those things. But we too, of course, ran into a little bit of that. And we would have lots of discussions over the years about, you know, how we wanted to handle it or how they wanted to deal with it. And, you know, sometimes we turn it around and they would say things like, oh, that's cool that you like school. I like to sleep in and I like video games. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes that would go, huh, they would go, wait a minute. Um, or in just what Pam said too, like we would share questions or things about things that we love. So I thought of an example I was just sharing with somebody yesterday how did you know that vulture poop is an amazing sanitizer because it contains a digestive acid that virtually kills all bacterial and viruses <laughs> so <laughs> we have all kinds of those things because we explore the world you know and so we all have things that we know that other people don't know and so keeping it light and fun and you know just sharing the things that we love can be a strategy that really changes the energy because it is a lot about energy and like Ann said if you can keep you know if your kids can keep that energy up of we love our life. And, you know, that's really where my girls kept it. They were like, yeah, whatever, have at it. You know, if that's how you want to spend your time. <laughs> you know? like, we're fun. So, you know, it's, it's that. So when you see the child becoming deflated, like that's where I would worry, you know, but, but my girls are always like, that's cool that you like that. I really like this better, you know? Um, but I think, and Pam may have also mentioned this, like if these are important friends, like if this is some where they want to, you know, establish relationships and not, and not just going there just for the gymnastics, then, you know, help them find ways to connect and become closer and maybe hang out or get to know them outside of gymnastics. Because I think that personal connection really stops that kind of bullying behavior as we humanize one another. Um, if it moves into that more bullying type territory, I would talk to the people involved. And I loved Pam's idea of just kind of proactively addressing it because I think so often it is that it's just it's when we don't know something, we're confused by it sometimes. And there's those of us that look at that as curiosity and interest and want to learn more about it. And there's those of us that kind of try to shut it down and are scared of change or things that are different. And so just kind of understanding that piece of human nature and seeing if there's a way to address it is really, you know, I think a lovely way to maybe diffuse some of that. So, and I would also probably see if I could be closer to observe what's going on and, you know, see as opposed to, because you mentioned that you're not there and you don't know what's happening and it's, you know, what just what your boys are saying. And I guess that little piece also made me think what your boys is saying is valid and important. And so, you know, I just watch the energy and language about that too. But anyway, so hopefully those are some ideas that you can, can use. <laughs> And that is the last question for this month. Thanks so much to both of you for answering questions with me. It's always so fun. And I always love seeing what take you guys <laughs> take. <laughs> and just a reminder, there are links in the show notes for the things that we've mentioned in the episode. And Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online is open for registration yes. until the end of January. Yay. And as always, yay. <laughs> If you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. Reviewers have said, A quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning. This little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And, I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. 
Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.